Okay, listen. We've talked a lot about deadly paints on this channel. Chrome green, orpiment yellow, uranium orange, cinnabar red. But out of this incredible rainbow of deadly paints, happy pride, by the way, it may surprise you to learn that the world's deadliest pigment, the most dangerous color in human history, is Paris green. Like white. Paris green, sometimes known as emerald green, was first invented in 1814 by combining arsenic trioxide with copper to acetate. And was first invented so that both artists and common people could have access to a brighter, more saturated green than they ever had before. The world's deadliest color isn't what you think it is. It's way worse. Let's make some paint from it, shall we? So here's the thing, the term deadliness actually has two completely different meanings. The first is that of chemical deadliness, or lethality. This refers to how deadly a substance is on a per unit or per dose basis. Basically, whatever substance takes the least amount to kill you, yeah, that's gonna be the deadliest in terms of chemical lethality. The second is what I call historical or practical deadliness. How many lives have actually been lost to this substance? What has led to the deaths of the most people throughout history? To try and illustrate the difference between these two types of deadliness, a quick example two of the deadliest animals on Earth. The first is the inland taipan. This is widely considered to be the deadliest snake on the planet. It's found from Australia to the southern edge of New Guinea, and these unassuming little dudes grow up to eight feet, and a single bite is enough to kill 100 people. That's how strong their venom is. So yeah, freaking yikes! <laughs> this is a mosquito, although not as immediately dangerous or lethal as the inland Taipan, mosquitoes are responsible for between 750,000 to a million deaths every single year, while the inland Taipan has only been responsible for, oh, none. Yeah, none. They have no recorded cases of deaths from the most venomous snake in the world. Honestly, kind of impressive. So why does the mosquito have so many deaths attached to it? Well, it's because mosquitoes carry diseases like malaria and dengue. And it's these diseases that make the humble mosquito responsible for hundreds of thousands of deaths every single year. And yet I'm willing to bet good money that you would much rather be trapped in an elevator with a mosquito than an inland taipan. In this situation, arsenic green is the inland taipan, and lead white is the mosquito, killing millions upon millions of people in a slow, insidious dance of death. But before we get too far into poison, let me talk to you about a different kind of threat. A digital one. This city's full of shadows. Some you see, and some you don't. I thought I'd seen it all until I typed my name into that search bar. There it was, page after page of data brokers, peddling my info like cheap cigars. My phone number, my address, emails older than my great aunt's fruitcakes. I'd been tailed for years and never even known it. That's when today's sponsor, Aura, waltzed into my office with an offer I couldn't refuse. Metaphorically, obviously, apps can't really waltz. Ever wonder how those scammers got your number? Or why your inbox looks like a junkyard these days? It's the data brokers. Companies full of sharks that scoop up your data and sell it to anybody for a quick buck. And you're the one left swimming with the fishes. And sure, these sites are supposed to take your info down, if you ask. But they make that harder than digging out a rogue bullet with a Q-tip. Believe me, I tried. That's why me and my pals, we choose Aura. See, Aura does the dirty work for you. Pulling your info off these sites and keeping it off. Heck, even my ma uses it. But that's just a start. See, Aura's a digital security wise guy. And they've got a lot of tools in their briefcase, if you know what I'm saying. With real-time alerts, credit monitoring, and a 24-7 stakeout to make sure your identity is protected. And if something still goes sideways, you're backed by five million in identity theft insurance. No one deserves to have their private information stolen and pawned off like some cheap watches in a back alley. So try Aura free for 14 days at aura.com slash Becca and protect your information from all the sharks out there. Give those data brokers the slip. This concept, the two kinds of deadliness, is why this series is a two-parter. This one, the one you're watching right now, poison. The next episode, death. 
AKA we're starting out this episode with the Inland Taipan, Paris Green, the most lethal paint of all time. And then next time we are going to Lead White, which has killed the most people throughout history by an enormous landslide. But before we get to the humble mosquito, we must face the dance of death with the Inland Taipan. In 1814, two scientists in Germany, Wilhelm Sattler and Friedrich Russ, realized that Shields Green, another pigment that was already in existence that was also made of arsenic, uh, kind of sucked. Any time anything that was dyed with Shields Green came in contact with sulfur gas, it would get kind of nasty looking. And being that it was the early 1800s and people were burning coal out the wazoo, which makes sulfur gas, every day Shields' vibrant green was turning into more and more of Shields' suspicious looking brown. So naturally they teamed up with the Wilhelm Dye and White Lead Company, a name that is entirely too long in my personal opinion, and they got to work. Their goal? Create a green that wouldn't turn dookie color any time it came in contact with sulfur gas. Which is awesome if you just like ignore the fact that they made a dye that was a hundred times more poisonous than the last one. So you know, progress. Woohoo! By 1822, the recipe for this stuff, now called Emerald Green, was officially released to the public. And by 1867, it had earned the nickname Paris Green. Sounds classy, right? Well, super fun fact about this hot new clothing dye is that it also became the world's first chemical insecticide because it was alarmingly good at killing things. Most famously, it was great at killing pests like fruit flies, rats, and potato beetles. Unfortunately, it was also very good at killing factory workers occasionally. But listen, it's the Industrial Revolution. No one cares about silly little things like workers' rights <laughs> or basic human rights. Somehow the fact that it was basically just deadly poison with a little green hat on didn't really stop anyone from using it all over everything. In fact, not only did it become the world's first chemical insecticide, it also became a fan favorite in the art world. Van Gogh painted with it, Monet painted with it, even Gauguin painted with it. And to be fair, uh, yeah, it looked pretty freaking awesome. The only problem was that once Paris Green got a taste of fame, it started showing up everywhere for some reason. By 1860, more than 700 tons of Paris Green were being made every single year in Great Britain alone. And even more than that was being imported from Europe. Why? Well, arsenic mines were booming at the moment, and making a bunch of green pigment and dyeing everything green proved to test a lot more popular with the public than just making millions upon millions of pounds of rat poison. In addition, it was heavily marketed to and used by those in the middle class because it made this really bright green, which was a color that was previously unattainable by those who weren't in the upper class, accessible to pretty much everybody. And before we get people in the comments who are like, Victorian people were so freaking stupid. In a lot of cases, people actually totally knew how toxic this pigment was. Or at the very least, they knew that it was toxic. Think of it like the smoking of the Victorian era. Everybody knows it's bad for you, but it doesn't change the fact that hundreds of thousands of people just kinda did stuff with it anyway. Besides, as a baker who used Paris green to paint the shelves his bread cooled on said, without arsenic, it's impossible to get a good green. Wallpaper. Books, shoes, ball gowns, magazines, toys, candy wrappers. If it had a surface, it was doomed at some point to be painted a bright emerald green. This was especially problematic when it came to things like children's toys and rooms. And that's because a lot of toy manufacturers painted very loose coats of Paris green on everything from blocks to balls to hobby horses. Now, naturally, because little kids are famous for putting everything in their mouth, having a bunch of books and toys that were covered in literal arsenic led to a public health crisis. So now that we've established that Paris Green was both a household danger and a public safety crisis, let's make some into paint, shall we? 
Now, the first thing that I do when I make any toxic paint is to put on full PPE, because remember kids, protection is key. That being said, the real key is not making paint out of arsenic. Why would you? I'm doing it, so you don't have to. This is a vintage canister of Paris Green that I estimate to be from around the year 1945. Obviously, this sample is advertised as an insecticide. And if those big old letters that say poison concern you, it should, because this is literally 40% arsenic. Do not do this. What's really cool about this sample versus other samples of Paris Green that I've seen and owned is that this one was stored completely away from light, which means that the pigment of the arsenic itself is still very, very strong. Which, while not an excuse for making arsenic into paint, does mean that it looks very pretty. So by this point, we all know Paris Green was toxic, but like, how toxic are we talking? Well, buckle up because- Honey, you've got a big storm coming. To try and put the toxicity of Paris Green into perspective, a single gram, roughly the size of a green sprinkle on a cupcake, contains enough arsenic to kill an adult. And coincidentally, there are reputable accounts of people using Paris Green in confections like cake decorations, because apparently 19th century food additive laws were basically non-existent. But here's what makes it so dangerous. Paris Green is a compound of copper 2 acetate and arsenic trioxide. That arsenic trioxide is a cellular wrecking ball. When it gets into your body, it blocks the enzymes that your cells need to produce energy. No enzyme equals no energy equals your organs start to shut down and basically you just have a real bad time. Meanwhile, arsenic also destroys red blood cells, causes severe vomiting and diarrhea, wrecks your liver and kidneys, attacks your nervous system, and eventually causes your heart to stop beating. Neat! And if that weren't enough, the copper in Paris green can make it even more absorbable through your skin. So yeah, those green ball gowns and book covers, they were super fashion forward biohazards. Basically, if lead paint was death by a thousand cuts, Paris green was one of those Mark Rober glitter bomb packages held up to a Victorian chandelier with a single piece of reused scotch tape. And to emphasize just how bad things were, James C. Wharton, author of The Arsenic Century, said, Many of the papers supplied to kindergarten children for our projects were arsenical, a 12-inch square sheet of one being found to contain double the fatal dose of arsenic for an adult. Teachers eventually became aware of the toxicity of such papers and began to warn pupils not to put the material into their mouths. But even those children who obeyed might well take the completed project home where a younger sibling knew no better. Absolutely fantastic book, by the way. It is pretty much hundreds of pages of accounts just like that. From people getting sick from arsenical candles, to arsenic-laden chocolate wrappers, to women wearing ball gowns that contained enough poisonous green dye to slay the admirers she may meet with in half a dozen ballrooms. Slay queen, I am deceased. You have literally killed me. I am dead queen. But just a couple of decades after it started, the music of the arsenic waltz was already coming to an end. In 1836, the forensic chemist James Marsh invented the Marsh test while he was trying to prove a case of arsenic poisoning in court. This test was sensitive enough to detect as little as 0 0.02 milligrams of arsenic. And suddenly arsenic wasn't an invisible poison, it was evidence. In the process, it also accidentally exposed crazy levels of arsenic all over the wallpapers, books, toys, and food in Victorian homes. People knew that Paris Green wasn't the best, sure, but they didn't quite realize the amount of danger that they were putting themselves in daily. By the 1840s, governments across Prussia, Bavaria, and France started going, yeah, I think we're done with the whole, look at my cute new wallpaper. The only negative side effects it gives me are constant headaches and stomach pain. I wonder why. And they began outlawing arsenic pigments. Meanwhile, Britain reluctantly rolled out poison control around 1851 and fully banned arsenic in wallpaper and textiles by 1868. It all really started slowing down in the late 1800s, when public freakout, medical horror stories, and safer synthetic greens finally smothered the production of Paris Green for good. Mostly. It must be said we were using it as a pesticide through the 1950s? What the?
After less than a century of deadly green arsenic paints, dyes, and textiles, the music of the arsenic waltz had finally slowed to a stop. Paris green, the inland taipan of pigments, had finally been defanged. But just as that snake slithered out of the spotlight, another killer was left waiting in the wings. Slower, sneakier, less colorful, and way, way, way deadlier. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video, and thank you so much to my patrons. If you would like to support my mission to provide free education for art history online, you can join my Patreon by clicking the link in the description below. We have live streams every couple of weeks, exclusive raffles, and other fun stuff. I hope that you're having an amazing week, and I will see you guys next time, where we'll talk about the actual deadliest paint in the world. I think it's time to go to bed. It is 3.31, holy cannolis. This is an incredibly squeaky chair. Chrome orange, orpidum, and we are cinnabar red. I'm so tired.